In the waters of the Western Atlantic and Caribbean, a voracious alien predator has taken hold. We have never before seen a marine invasion of this magnitude or scale. Lionfish are indigenous to the Indo-Pacific. They've evolved over many thousands of years in a complicated system where everything has had time to work out its place and its controlling mechanisms. Not so in the Atlantic, where this invasive species is a major threat to biodiversity and the health of already stressed coral reef ecosystems. The biggest concern we have is lionfish predation on other marine life. They are a voracious, gluttonous feeder. They're an ambush predator, and they're very uniquely camouflaged. So they can sneak up very close to their prey. And our prey here in this range have not evolved with lionfish and don't see them as a predator. One of the key findings of the research that we've been doing here in the Bahamas is that lionfish have likely reduced fish populations on many of these reefs by up to 90% in the last four years. It's a free-for-all for lionfish right now. No predators, lots of food, just a kid in a candy store. The million dollar question is what are we gonna do about this? Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources. They are stunning fish with striking stripes and long flamboyant fins. Native to the Indo-Pacific and Red Sea, lionfish are members of the scorpion fish family. Lionfish are very popular aquarium fish, and they're sold in very large numbers in the United States. Very ornate, beautiful fish. They tend to eat a lot, and they eat the other aquarium fish, some of the expensive aquarium fish. These lionfish will outgrow an aquarium in many cases. Also, the expense of keeping an aquarium can be price inhibitive. So what happens is the people uh, run out of money to maintain their aquarium and they, rather than bring the fish back to the pet store, they just release them into the wild. And some of those fish got together and began to reproduce. Experts believe they can trace the origins of this invasion to South Florida, where the first lionfish were spotted in the wild. Actually, 1985 in Miami was the first record. And then a very few records in the early and mid-90s as well. Um, there is a popular myth that Hurricane Andrew destroyed a, a bayfront aquarium in South Florida in Miami. But it's all second and third hand information. It's never been proven. And the genetics don't really support that. Even if that bayfront aquarium was destroyed, we know that there were more than just those few fish involved in the invasion. While the invasion was likely caused by more fish than what could have escaped the aquarium, genetic testing has traced the massive invasion back to around nine fish on the maternal line. That's looking like, you know, a very small number of fish that started this whole invasion. The U.S. Geological Survey keeps track of all the confirmed lionfish sightings on a detailed map. Starting in the late 90s, we began to see an increase up the east coast of Florida. And then in 2000, up into the southeast U.S., Georgia, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Bermuda, out in the Atlantic. The Gulf Stream carried the lionfish eggs and larvae northward, allowing the fish to establish themselves along the east coast of the United States. Only the colder temperatures of the northern Atlantic have kept the animals from taking hold in the northeast. We do know that the thermal tolerance for lionfish is about 60 degrees Fahrenheit, 12 degrees C. But even with that thermal tolerance, 
Every summer, lionfish uh, during the warm months make it as far north as uh, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, and New York. Obviously, in the wintertime, it's too cold for those fish to survive, so they don't make it. But the invasion didn't stop there. There is an eddy of the Gulf Stream that kind of peels into the Bahamas between Grand Bahama and Bimini. And even though there's not a lot of connectivity between uh, the Bahamas and the Florida coast, there's enough through that eddy that some of the eggs were entrained and dropped over into the Bahamas. And once those fish began to reproduce in this very abundant, diverse habitat, they really took hold. The first fish showed up in the Bahamas in 2004, and then the spread moved southward to Turks and Caicos, Hispaniola, Cuba, and then westward, Jamaica, Cayman, Central America, and now is following down the South American coast. Lionfish are also spreading into the Gulf of Mexico, and after all these years, are showing up in increasing numbers in South Florida. So the dispersal we see in this distribution is due to fish in one area reproducing and their eggs and larvae being carried in the currents to a new area where those fish begin to mature. And along the east coast of Florida, we have the Gulf Stream current moving north. So fish in South Florida were reproducing, but their eggs and larvae were being carried north and there was no additional supply into that South Florida population. So fish to the south of us in Cuba, Mexico, Belize, are reproducing and their eggs and larvae are making it into South Florida. So even though th this all started in South Florida, it took about a decade or so for us to start to see the effects full circle. Lad Akins, who works for the nonprofit Reef Environmental Education Foundation based out of Key Largo, Florida, has done a lot of research on the lionfish invasion. Together with Stephanie Green, a marine ecologist from Simon Fraser University in Vancouver, Canada. He is conducting a number of research projects in the Bahamas. The Bahamas definitely are ground zero for the lionfish invasion. The island chain's tropical waters and coral reefs make it an ideal habitat for lionfish. On the island of Eleuthera, Ladd and Stephanie are conducting a number of different studies to better understand how the lionfish affect local marine habitats and what might be done to alleviate those impacts. We have a giant experiment set up in Rock Sound, which is this really large body of water that is extremely similar habitat, about 10 feet deep all the way across with these almost perfect little replicated coral heads every few hundred meters. And that essentially is the perfect playground in which to do this experiment. We've taken 24 of those reefs and we've divided them into four different treatments. A number of those reefs we have taken all the lionfish off of, we're not leaving any. And then we have two treatments where we've left a few lionfish numbers that we've predicted to have a low probability of impact and also a high probability of impact on the fish communities. And then the remainder of the reefs we're using as essentially a scientific control. We're not removing lionfish from those reefs, but we are monitoring what changes over time. And essentially we can compare uh, the reefs where we've manipulated lionfish numbers, removed them, to those reefs where they remain to see what differences occur. Ladd and Stephanie are working closely with experts from the Cape Eleuthera Institute, who helped them set up their experiment in late 2009. Now, they are monitoring the project when Ladd and Stephanie aren't there. I've been heading out monthly and checking in on those reefs and conducting surveys. When we first started this work, we conducted very detailed baseline inventories of those sites, and the coral cover, the relief of the site off the bottom, so we count every single little fish and size every single fish on those reefs along a transect line so we can get the amount of fish per square meter of reef, as well as counting how many lionfish and determining the size of the lionfish. And then all that is put into a pretty sophisticated model that spits out, based on lionfish consumption, how many lionfish we believe that reef can support based on the available food. And that's what's directing the different treatments. The scientists are hoping to answer a number of different questions. 
What we want to find out is how many lionfish a reef can support without having dramatic impacts to the marine life on that site. And if you remove lionfish from a site that's had a lot of lionfish, will the marine life come back? And really that's going to direct uh, control efforts. If you know that you can still have one or two lionfish on a reef without having negative impacts, well that will change the way you look at, at removal efforts. The scientists use two main methods to collect the lionfish. One of them is hand nets, designed for the aquarium industry where they live capture their fish for aquarium exhibits or, or resale. And the hand nets tend to work very, very well, especially for the smaller lionfish. In heavily invaded areas where you have very large lionfish, and a lot of them, spearing can also be effective. Uh, lionfish aren't a fast-moving fish, and they're a perfect candidate for successful spearing. Divers need to use caution as they capture the animals since their spines contain a potent venom. It can provide a very painful sting and in rare cases, more severe complications. Uh, it's a neurotoxin venom, protein-based. So we tend to avoid stings by wearing protective gloves, puncture-proof gloves, which are actually used in the hospital industry to prevent needle sticks. If, however, someone is stung by a lionfish, treatment is pretty basic. Basically, immersion in hot water of the affected area starts to break down the protein base of the venom and relieves the pain at the same time. Once the fish are caught and brought back to land, the researchers analyze the animal's stomach contents to see what native species the lionfish prey on. Oh, squirrel fish. This is the last thing that a lot of fish see. Um, and they swallow their prey whole, and then their stomachs are really acidic, so it breaks the fish or crustaceans down really, really quickly. So there, there are no teeth involved. They're what we call a gape-limited predator, so anything that is small enough to fit in their mouths, they can consume. And it tends to be fish or other prey that are up to half their total size sometimes. We found lionfish with the tails of their prey sticking back out of their throat still. And they really are a gluttonous feeder. Their stomach can expand up to 30 times its normal size when they're eating. And so basically the fact that it can consume a wide array of species and they can consume such large prey really means that they have the capacity to do a lot of damage. And so we've got uh, liver here, stomach. We'll take the stomach out. We've been sending off a lot of samples like this that we can't tell the species for DNA analysis so that we get a species identification. We've documented over 50 species of reef fishes in the stomach as well as crustaceans and all sorts of other critters. They're really hitting the reef quite hard on all fronts. Things that will grow up to be large as adults but also things that stay really small. I'm not really aware of any other predator that eats so broadly. There are several reasons why lionfish numbers have exploded in the Atlantic. For one, the animals reproduce frequently. Lionfish reach maturity at a very small size, a very young age, so very quickly in their life they're able to reproduce. And they're pair spawners, so a single male and single female get together and reproduce. In the warmer climates like South Florida and the, and the islands, the Caribbean and the Bahamas, lionfish can reproduce throughout the year We'll open it up and I'll show you guys this. This entire thing is one ovary. They have two of them. All these tiny little spots, each of them is an egg. So some work that's been done up at the NOAA lab in North Carolina shows that there's up to 30,000 eggs in one spawn and that this is happening every four to six days in the Caribbean year round. So that's one reason why they're so successful in establishing all over the place. Another reason why lionfish have inundated the Western Atlantic and Caribbean is the fact that they have no known predators or parasites in this part of the world. 
they can put a lot more energy into growth and reproduction. And we see lionfish here in the Atlantic and Caribbean much larger than they're known to grow in the native range. Native range maximum size is reported to be about 35 centimeters. And here we're finding lionfish almost half a meter in length. And that, that is a big, big lionfish. To better understand how lionfish move and grow, the scientists are tagging them on those study sites where they haven't been captured. And we tag them underwater rather than bring them to the surface, which could cause some, some barotrauma pressure change injuries on the fish and would require uh, anesthetizing the fish and it'd be a very lengthy, detailed process. The process is a little bit tricky. You're dealing with the live fish on the bottom with venomous spines. It involves using a small strip of plastic attached to a sewing needle. This thin plastic strip is called a Floy streamer tag and it has a serial number and contact information. And we put that right through the base of the tail of the fish. And the hope is we can revisit some of the sites that we tagged fish and adjacent reef areas and see if we can recapture those fish at a later date to get that movement and growth information. And the information that we're getting out of these tagging studies is vitally important to designing control programs that'll be effective. And when we do recollect the fish after the tagging at the end of the research, we don't let them go again. To do all this time-intensive work, Ladd and Stephanie rely heavily on the help of volunteers who assist in their efforts. And we were doing all sorts of stuff, whether it was uh, helping hold the bags, uh, literally to physically um, collect the lionfish, uh, to once they've been tagged, then we would take them back to their original site and let them go. The volunteers have been extremely crucial in a couple of ways to the lionfish research. Through using volunteers, you can collect a large amount of scientific data that normally you wouldn't be able to because researchers don't have a lot of money or time. To me, it's just my little pot trying to eradicate a problem. That's my whole desire, and I hope other people out there have the same feelings I do and jump on board to help. As part of their research, the scientists have observed all kinds of interesting behavior, including this video lad shot of two lionfish fighting for dominance. Lionfish are related to the scorpion fish, and all scorpion fish have a pretty bony head. And uh, we've seen aggressive posturing between male lionfish. And they use these bony cheeks up against each other's sides to kind of rake along the side uh, when they're having a little tiff, trying to determine who's the dominant male for, for spawning with females. Scientists say there's still a lot they need to learn about lionfish, such as how old they get and at what depths they can live. The depth ranges of lionfish we know are as shallow as inches deep up against a shoreline. And we don't know the maximum depth yet, but we know at least as deep as 500 feet. A report from a submarine and, uh, saw lionfish that deep. The one thing experts do know is that these animals present a major threat to the biodiversity and ecosystem health of this region. The spread since 2007 has been more dramatic than any of us could have imagined. So rapid, so intense, the population uh, has exploded in areas that become invaded. And we're finding in many instances that lionfish have likely reduced populations by up to 90% in just four short years since colonizing the area. So we've seen huge reductions in the numbers of fish, also potentially in diversity, and so the impacts of these fish are profound. At this time, removal of the lionfish seems to be the only solution to this growing problem. Eradication is not likely going to be possible based on what we know right now, but we can control populations to a level that the impacts may be minimized. And, and right now, that's a major, major goal. And we know we are 
the ultimate at being able to wipe out marine life, wipe out fish stocks, but we have to have that incentive to do it, and that incentive is money. I think developing a market for lionfish is a very smart way to go, and for larger lionfish, that market is a food market. They really are a delicious fish, and that's you know, probably one of the saving graces of this whole invasion is the fact that you can actually consume them and it, that they taste so good. Lionfish taste similar to hogfish and snapper, and the meat can be prepared in a variety of ways. Nutritional studies have shown that lionfish are actually higher in omega-3s than some of the more common food fish, and efforts are currently underway to develop a commercial market for lionfish. Bermuda has developed a slogan. They say, eat them to beat them. And I really think that's a good way to go. To make catching the animals more efficient, the researchers are testing out a variety of different traps. We're trying a few different trap designs and a few different baiting schemes to see if we can design something that would be effective for lionfish but not have a lot of other bycatch and not impact the other fish species as well. We actually have been able to catch some lionfish in our traps, but the amount of bycatch that we caught during that same trapping scheme was just too high to be really considered an effective removal. So we've adjusted some of our trapping treatments and we're trying a few different things now. We're uh, putting escape panels into the traps and, and we'll just keep at it to see if we can come up with an effective design for lionfish. Maybe we can't. Maybe bycatch is always gonna be too high, but that's something that we need to know. Diver removals can be very effective where they can dive, but you know, you can't dive everywhere. But fishermen can deploy traps in a, in a wide range of areas. So if we can have that effective trap design, we think we can engage the fishing community. In an effort to get the public involved in capturing the fish, the Reef Environmental Education Foundation and its partners began organizing fishing tournaments, or derbies, in the Bahamas in 2009. Since then, the derbies have caught on in other areas, including the Florida Keys. Basically what the Derby's goal is, is to raise awareness about lionfish and also uh, dispel some of the rumors that the meat is venomous. Cash prizes are offered as incentives for fishermen to participate. If you're out of sight, you're oh out yeah, of they did pretty well. 115. We have most lionfish per boat. And then we also have largest lionfish, and we do smallest lionfish too, <laughs> unlike other spearfishing tournaments. You can use a spear, you can use nets, whatever method of collection you like. The most lionfish of the entire derby with 111 lionfish Yay! is raw talent. Uh, these derbies though, the, the main purpose of them is to raise awareness and get people involved in collecting lionfish and also we have a big cookout at the end of the derby and people get to try lionfish and taste for themselves how delicious they are. And as long as people have incentive to harvest, they will harvest. Much is being done to raise awareness of the lionfish invasion and to figure out ways to halt the problem. While certain areas in the Bahamas are already overrun with lionfish, experts hope that it is not too late to keep this from happening in other parts of the invaded range where the animals are just now beginning to establish. Why not just let this run its course? Let it become part of the system and you know it'll assimilate and everything will find its way to work out. And that's a very valid question. And I understand that question and the viewpoint that some people may have along those lines. However, this is not a natural occurrence. This is a man-made occurrence. It's in effect biological pollution that we're seeing. And it's up to us to fix the problem. If we let it run its own course, our native species who are not at fault 
are the ones that are going to pay the price and we will ultimately pay the price following that. And I think that's a good enough reason for us to really want to address this invasion and remove lionfish. This really is a region-wide threat that's potentially one of the worst ecological disasters that the Caribbean could face. But really, it's also a huge opportunity for us to be proactive on a conservation issue. I think humans have made a history out of not being proactive when it comes to conservation, when it comes to understanding the problems that are out there and doing something about them before they really take over a system. A lot of marine conservation, you're telling people, don't do this, don't do that, don't go here, don't go there. With lionfish, we're saying, yes, do get involved, do go out and fish for them, do eat them. And I think that is really a benefit, if there is anything you know, to be optimistic about, is the fact that you can bring people together on this. Major funding for this program was provided by the Bachelor Foundation, encouraging people to preserve and protect America's underwater resources.